All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium. We're a nonprofit society dedicated to the conservation of aquatic life. Uh, we have a presentation tonight called Monster Data, Unveiling the Secret Lives of Marine Mammals. And uh, when I was initially talking to our host, our, our, our co-host tonight, Dr. Andrew Treitz, about this presentation, I was like, um, Andrew, who, who wants to come to a presentation that, that's going to talk about a lot of data? And uh, he said, actually, there's a ton of people that love to talk about data. Do you know what kind of data we're talking about? And as it turns out, we're going to be talking about data that are used in order to see what marine mammals are doing underwater. Um, and I remember thinking about critter cams when I was younger and how exciting those were. So uh, we might get to learn a little bit about some of that tonight. And then uh, he mentioned that there are some animals that are in the ocean uh, today that have uh, um, electronics attached to them so that we're able to record and collect these data uh, that are as sophisticated as cell phones. And I, I have to confess, I, I don't even have a cell phone myself. So it's kind of hard to believe that there are wildlife out there that are more connected than I am. Uh, so. Uh, with that, with that uh, I'm going to introduce our, our co-host tonight. Um, uh, his name is Dr. Andrew Treitz. He's a professor at the University of British Columbia and a research associate at the Vancouver Aquarium. And uh, he's brought together a collection of experts from around the world uh, to do a workshop on building bioanalytic theory for the analysis of marine mammal movements. And uh, I would also like to thank the Peter Wall Institute and the University of British Columbia for supporting our event tonight, uh, Dr. Andrew Treitz. Thank you, Jonathan. A hundred years ago, if you wanted to learn something about a marine mammal, it usually meant you had to kill it first. Um, and you might record where you killed it, so you have something about location. You probably look in its stomach to see maybe what it ate and take a few body measurements. And of course, each animal would only give you one or two or maybe three data points. A hundred years later, we are collecting literally billions of data points per animal. And as Jonathan said, when I approached him and said, could we come, I've got some statisticians I'd like you to meet, uh, <laughs> it did take a little bit of arm twisting to make him realize that this is the way of present day research. We are now equipping animals with cell phone technologies. And this past week, We've been working here with biologists, sitting together with statisticians, as we've essentially come to the realization that we're now dealing with data sets that are so big and so massive that the biologists need some extra support. You're going to hear from five other speakers, and each is going to give you a little tidbit of something that they found truly amazing uh, using some of the modern technologies. One of the questions that unites all of us is this one about where do they go and what are they doing? And while they might seem fairly simple questions, they're actually very, very complicated to answer. On the back of this animal, you can see we have a device, we collectively call them biologgers, and such are their microcomputers, and each one can cost anywhere from $2,000, and if your animal is really well dressed, it may have $10,000 of instruments on its back. Some of the data we have to recover which means trying to recapture the animal or have the tag fall off and float and count with someone like you to find it on the beach. Um, some of the data is transmitted to satellites and we can track some of this in real time. One of the key people that I've been working with and some of our graduate students at UBC have been working with is Dr. Jim Zidick. He's a professor in the Department of Statistics and I was sort of amused tonight as people are asking him questions about marine mammals. And you did a very good job, Jim. And now you can come up and share more of your expertise. Mike's right here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here uh, to talk about uh, our involvement in this, in this project that Andrew has introduced. Uh, you, 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 you know, it all started by a chance meeting that took place with, between one of my colleagues and uh, Andrew uh, at the University of British Columbia when they struck up a conversation and she, he told Nancy Heckman that there was the statistical issues involved and so this whole uh, project was really born in that circumstance. Uh, what he essentially said is that uh, we need a statistician and there is this old saying that when you think you need a statistician, you do. 
<laughs> 19 times out of 20. <laughs> and I think, I think this is one of the 19. And, uh, so, and so that's how the, thing, uh, the project started. But I would add that um, uh, we also discovered pretty quickly that we certainly needed the biologists. And so it's been a very, uh, very good working, uh, a scientific working relationship in which we've been sharing our knowledge and doing some things together. Uh, so as, uh, as Andrew indicated, uh, the reason he did come across the street, I guess, is because of the uh, vast amounts of data that are s so great that it's very difficult to analyze them by using any traditional methods. And so in this uh, graphic, you see the question restated about these uh, creatures and where they go. Uh, so these tags that, uh, as Andrew said, these tags that are now used are very much like uh, the cell phones, uh, which have, of course, changed our lives, and um, I've got one. Uh, inside this remarkable machine, there is uh, something that, uh, that there's a compass. I, I suppose you have one, and you may know there's a compass in yours. And uh, there's lots of other uh, technology, so you can actually track, I can track you if, if I had the right uh, skills. Uh, I certainly track my wife now, and uh, I can actually tell you where she shops, but uh, she doesn't actually know this, so I want, uh, but she's not here tonight, so I think I'm safe in mentioning this. Uh, the, uh, these sea animals, uh, of course, carry uh, something, like, uh, a, 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 something like a cell phone, as Andrew has indicated, and it contains an amazing number of things which it shares in common with the cell phone, such as this compass. A magnetometer, it's called, as I've learned. Accelerometer, there's a gyroscope in some of them. Uh, they carry depth monitors. And they also carry a GPS uh, device so that their uh, location can sometimes be determined. The trouble is uh, that uh, they, when, they, when they are released, they don't always stay on the surface of the water. Uh, and so they actually go underneath. They dive. Uh, and uh, this character then might become invisible for some considerable period of time, and in fact his location bec will become unknown uh, for a time. Oops, there's a GPS uh, location. It's just now been recorded. So we knew this creature was there, and, uh, and then after the dive was completed, oh, there's another GPS location. Now, the question marks are there because who knew what happened to that animal in between those two dots? And the distance between those two dots can be quite great uh, in, in some cases, depending on what they're doing. So it raises a big question about what these creatures were doing whilst they're under, un, under, the, under the sea. Um, so to fill in the do to join the dots, you might uh, think of a, uh, an approach that was kind of the one used by the ancient mariners, who had ships and went to sea, and they had compasses, and they could uh, drag loggers behind and get some idea of their speed. And so, if you put the speed together with the direction, you sort of know where you're going, right? Well, why not do the same thing with this with the seal phone data, as I call it? And so, if you did that. Uh, you would uh, kind of get a new a plot of a new position. This is a, the so-called dead reckoning approach. And it's a pretty good approach, except that there are a lot of, uncert a lot of variables, uh, such as current and so on, which can't be captured. So in this, in this graphic, you see what's happened when you applied the de dead reckoning algorithm. Uh, it's, that, uh, it's that path down below. It's a wiggly path, but it doesn't come anywhere near the second GPS plot. Uh, so, uh, so, so this, uh, lo th this, these um, seal phones are generating a lot of data, uh, but uh, the the data themselves, that is the magnetic, the magnetometer, direction, speed, and so on, don't tell the whole story. In other words, you didn't find the second dot in this way. And so the, the question that Andrew was raising is, uh, how do you, how do you uh, try to fix that? And so that's where we came into the picture. So the first thing we learned is that these, these uh, instruments generate this vast amount of data, data. And what you're seeing here is a plot uh, for just one minute. 
there, there's something like 16 uh, or more uh, pieces of information generated every second in these little devices. 16 per second. Here's two minutes. Oh, three minutes. That's already quite a lot. Ah, but now we're going to watch what happens over 29,000 minutes. Uh, I dare say we don't want to continue watching this graphic, uh, I can assure you, but uh, it's meant to, to convey, to give you a sense of this evolving set of data that's going along and being collected in that seal phone. This is what gives us so much data that we couldn't, uh, can't, can't, couldn't be analyzed. So then we knew we were in trouble. So I called on my friend and student, uh, Siegel, who's in the hall, uh, he's sitting in the third row, uh, to help me out with this. So Siegel's a, a really smart guy, and he decided to, to get to the bottom of things. So he decided to talk to one of the experts, and here in this the graphic you see him uh, talking to one of the experts, and I think he learned quite a bit from this experience. In any case, it was enough to get us started. <laughs> but you know, it really took a tremendous amount of work to get anywhere. And what you're seeing in this slide gives you some idea of all the failed attempts and some of the successes that we had in the process of about a year, almost, of working on this problem. And then we had our, eure our eure eureka moment when we discovered a way of tackling the problem. And so the overall plan was to use something called Bayesian melding, where you take these GPS location measurements and you combine them with the dead reckoning algorithm so you kind of get the best of both worlds. And in this simple model that you see on the, on the, on the screen, you, you, have, you have the uh, true location, which is, of course, the unknown thing. That's this, that's this thing, true location. That's unknown, but uh, here's the dead reckoning points, here's, uh, the, and here's the GPS points. And so this uh, equation is essentially correcting for the bias in the dead reckoning algorithm. And uh, so uh, that's a, that, seems, that looks like a fairly simple solution. But the, re the real ingenuity in Siegel's work was in figuring out some ways of uh, creating judicious approximations that would let us handle this large amount of data. And so that actually worked pretty well. And in this graphic, which is actually taken from the real data that Andrew and his uh, co-investigators have collected, you see for the Easting, this is a plot for the Easting, uh, you see in blue the dead reckoning path, and then you see in red the adjusted path with the GPS points on them. So you can see the adjustment has brought the GPS uh, uh, plot in line uh, is, uh, is uh, the uh, dead reckoning curve in line with the GPS measurements. And here's a closer look. This is the result of the statistical correction. And it also includes some error bands which sh uh, show the sort of outer limits of where we think that animal would have been in between the red dots in those points. So you might say, well, what difference does it make as to whether you get this accurate or not. And the answer has to do with some fundamental biological issues relating to the amount of energy that the animal is using. And this, in turn, relates to the food supply and various other important questions. So it is important to get this right, and that's one thing that has come out of our work. So, my con uh, so in, the, in conclusion, we've had a fairly happy outcome. At least we thought it was, but it's not clear to others involved in this, uh, that that was the, 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 the answer. And uh, anyway, we think this new method is, is, has worked and that it will have other successful applications in big data problems. So. Hey, thank you, Jim. Um, <laughs> what you see on here is a male northern fur seal. They breed in North America, in Alaska, and in California. And they migrate through Canadian waters, and in Canada, they are listed as a threatened species. In the United States, they're listed as a depleted species. Um, the bottom line is that they're declining. And so we and others have been doing research trying to figure out exactly why. And we've been putting tags onto animals. Here we've got um, a female, much smaller. You wouldn't try doing this on a big bull. 
and the tag is being glued to her fur. The animals molt their fur every year, so the tag will fall off. Well, in this case, we do retrieve the tag and we can remove it. But should a tag stay on, it will fall off when the animals molt, and they lose all their hair every year. This is just from eight days of data collection, and I don't know how many million data points are on here, but it's probably maybe in the order of over 100 million data points. Um, it's just incredible, the density of data. And different channels, we've got the depth, the speed, the light levels, the pitch, the roll, the time. Uh, there's water temperature. There's all sorts of things being collected on here. This was a track that was done in the Bering Sea from the Pribilof Islands. And you can see our attempts here to try to reconstruct movement, as well as the depths of the animals in the three-dimensional plot shown up here. Here's another way to look at the same data. Um, we're looking here at the Aleutian Islands, and we've got here the Pribilof Islands, St. Paul and St. George, and we attract animals going out from each of the islands. There are some thinking that the really important feeding areas, at least some people believe that to be the Pribilof Canyon and along the shelf break. But as you're watching all of these animals as we reconstructed where they were going, you see, maybe you don't see any pattern at all. Um, except that they all go back to where they started from because they all have pups and they've got to go back to deliver the milk. Um, and you may get a sense that some are staying more local and some may be going further. Some may be staying on the shelf and some are going out into the really deep water. And down here we've got a time stamp as this is just rolling along. We're into August. And the, the students are up on the island. We're watching this every evening, uh, keeping track. Uh, particularly in September came, they wanted to come home and they had to wait for that last seal to get back to shore. The longer lines show they're swimming really fast, and the short ones mean that they're spending longer in those spots. So that's one way to look at the data. The other is to try to look at all the data at once, such as this. And one thing you see is they really didn't end up going here very much or here, um, the way some people had predicted that they should. If you put all the data together and look at areas of highest use, you'll see then that they are using some areas more than others. In this case, it was just from one end of this island. Of course, we know that other islands use different regions, and the north end, they may feed more up to this side, for example. Down below, you've got this other neighborhood of seals down at Bogoslav Island. Big difference in timing. This population, which is decreasing, the females spend an average of about eight days looking for food, which they will turn into milk and go back to shore and spend a day feeding their pups. So that pup is fasting for eight days, whereas down here it's half that time. So the pup will end up getting twice as much milk, and perhaps not surprisingly, this population is increasing. So it's helped to give us some important clues as to what might be the problem, and thinking is probably not quite enough milk uh, that the mothers are able to produce to, to make the pups big enough so when they wean and leave the Bering Sea, they're in good shape to survive. So our next speaker is Brianna Wright. She's a researcher at Fisheries and Oceans Canada in Nanaimo and has done a lot of her graduate work on the North resident killer whales. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me here to speak today. Um, this is work that I did for a master's thesis at UBC, um, and it's work that uh, came out of the Pacific Biological Station in Nanaimo, uh, building on our long-term study there of resident killer whales. Um, so one of the things we really wanted to know about killer whales is how they were diving and behaving under the water when they were hunting uh, Pacific salmon. Uh, so instead of these long-term tags that Andrew has described, we wanted to know a lot about a very short period of time. So we used a device that um, picks up uh, very fine scale information but would last only about a, a day. Um, so here we are uh, trying to attach a tag to a whale. Um, we don't have the ability to capture these animals because they are so large and free swimming and obviously don't come on shore like a seal. So our strategy is to get a very long pole and try and approach this, this animal in a boat and um, attach our tag. Uh, the tag attaches which su with suction cups, um, which is a nice non-invasive way to attach a tag, and it has its own sort of um, timed release mechanism, so it will pop off at the end. So here it is up close. Uh, it has several different components to it. Um, 
the main one in the middle is a package of movement sensors. Um, basically what uh, Jim described earlier, we have a, a magnetometer or a compass in three axes and also an accelerometer or sort of a motion sensor in all three axes. And then a, a way to store this data because we don't have a, a transmission in this tag, we have to get it back um, to download the data. And then also batteries to run the tag, of course. Uh, a neat component of this tag is that it also has the ability to sample underwater sound. So it has underwater microphones or hydrophones um, on the back. And for killer whale work, this is hugely important because these animals hunt with sound. They echolocate um, to find their prey. Uh, so it gives you only half the picture if you know what the movement is. If you can get what the sound is as well, um, that gives you a more full idea of what's going on. Um, as I said before, there's the suction cups. And then we also have a VHF antenna on the tag so that when the whale is moving around, um, we can be on the water in our boat and follow it in real time and see what it's doing. And then there's a float built into the tag so when it does pop off, it floats to the surface and again we can use that VHF signal to find where our tag is if we don't have a, a sighting on it right away. Uh, so once we get our tag out on our killer whale and it's in the water column hunting some salmon, uh, the tag will tell us how deep in the water column is it going uh, when it's diving. It will also give us a measure of its body acceleration, so things like surge, which is a forward strike, um, heave, which is your up and down, and then sway, which would be a side to side. And these can all be translated into rotational measures, so you can tell how the animal is rolling, if its body is pitched forward or pitched upward, um, and those sorts of things. And then we have our sound component. So not only can we get an idea of the echolocation clicks and calls that this tagged animal is emitting, we'll also pick up any calls of other animals in the area. And resident killer whales tend to hunt together. They, do, they uh, will sort of move through an area, spread out and hunt fish um, singly, but then they will come together and share that prey. So there's a lot of, of vocal activity and a lot of clicking uh, going on while they're hunting, um, which as a researcher is really, really fascinating and interesting, but it's also a big challenge because how do you pick out your tagged animals, uh, clicks and calls from all this other cacophony of sound that's going on. Uh, another really neat use for DTAGs that uh, I didn't have a chance to do for my master's but which has been done um, by other researchers is to look at how these animals respond to other noise uh, sources in their environment such as uh, boat traffic, um, military sonar, things like that. Um, so this tag will also pick up those sounds and pick up the motion response of the whale to that sound. So what I'm going to show you now is uh, just kind of a, a 3D visualization of one of these foraging dives. This is a foraging dive by a juvenile animal, uh, I-106, uh, that we recorded. And we use this really neat uh, three-dimensional uh, visualization software to reconstruct its track in 3D so we can get an intuitive idea of what it's actually doing. So what this does is turns those raw feeds um, that Andrew had up into something that our eye and our brain can really wrap wrap around and understand. Um, and at the same time, I'll also play the sound of this animal as it's going th uh, through its chase. And so you can get an idea of the types of, of noises that it's making. Um, so so um, some things to look out for are you'll hear echolocation clicks. Uh, this whale encountered its prey at the surface, so you see a lot of kind of twisting at the top part, but then it will pursue the fish to death. So listen for the echolocation clicks. Um, there's a few vocalizations in there, especially around the point where it grabs the fish, it gets very excited. Um, and then another neat sound that we sort of discovered in the space of, of using these tags is that you can actually hear them munching the fish. So you can pinpoint that exact moment when they grab the fish and start tearing it apart. Uh, so if you've ever been at a dinner party and thought you were sitting next to someone that was chewing very noisily, uh, killer whales are even more noisy. <laughs> so I'll just give this a play. So there he is chasing that fish on the surface where he encountered it. Now he's headed down. Uh, we discovered that salmon tend to dive in response to being chased by a killer whale, trying to get away, uh, wait out that whale and hope it has to breathe. Um, before, before the fish gets caught. And you will hear a lot of sort of flow noise sound as the whale accelerates. 
There's some very faint clicking there. There's some clicking. <laughs> And the faster those clicks are spaced, presumably the closer the whale is to its prey because it's trying to update its uh, knowledge of where that fish is. So the closer the fish is, the closer that echo, or the faster the echo comes back to it. So it's accelerating a lot more now. This is kind of getting towards the end of the chase. You can hear a lot of flow noise over the tag uh, because the animal is moving faster. Main tech location there is hard to hear. <laughs> Presumably that's the happy I got a fish sound. <laughs> um, this is really powerful technology um, and you can probably hear some crunching soon I think. Maybe. Oh, not quite. Anyways, it's a little bit uh, more obvious with a, a bit more amplification on the speaker, but they do make a lot of crunching sounds. So it's really neat to be able to uh, pair these sounds that we're hearing, that we used to just drop a hydrophone over the boat and hear all these sounds and we had no context for them, um, other than, well, this group appears to be foraging and that would be the only context we had. Now we can take that sound, link it directly to the individual behavior of a single animal and try and pinpoint exactly what these sounds mean and where they fit in with the diving behavior. Thanks. Thank you. So our next speaker has come from France, where he is a research scientist at the National Research Center, and he spends a lot of his time in the sub-Antarctic studying marine mammals. Christophe Guinet. Thank you, and Thank you, Andrew. So it's a pleasure for me to be back to Vancouver and to the aquarium, where I spent six months last year. So I'm studying mostly marine mammals in the Southern Ocean. And uh, we have been, over the last 10 years, we have been using elephant seals, I mean, first of all, to study their ecology at sea, but also to use these animals to collect some information about the environment where they live on. And I'm going to show you that. So first of all, we need to uh, catch these seals. I mean, elephant seals are the biggest seal living on, the, on Earth. I mean, a male elephant seal can weigh up, weigh up to 2.5 tons. And so to do that, we, you need to find strong and tall guys, which I'm not. So I'm so, it's why I'm sitting behind. And we use that, <laughs> that head bag, which cover the head of the seals to prevent the seals to bite you, but also to blind him, uh, to blind him. Uh, just enough for me to anesthetize the seals and then uh, when the seal is uh, tranquilized, we can start to glue some equipment on the head of the seal. So on the, on the head of the seals, we will glue uh, uh, a small, I, I don't know where is the pointer. So the center at the top. On the top, okay. So we will glue these small computers and uh, I'm going to show you what we can do with these small computers. First of all, uh, they will provide some information about the track of this seal. So this is Antarctica, South, South America, uh, Tasmania, New Zealand. And I'm working here on Kerguelen Island. And you can see that seals from Kerguelen Island will range all the way down to Antarctica. There is about 2,000 kilometers separating Kerguelen to Antarctica. And if you work on different elephant seals colonies, you can see that you can get a global coverage of the southern oceans. And this work is done by uh, several nations. I mean, France, Australia, the uh, United States, Germans, uh, people from South Africa. So by putting all this data together, we are collecting information about the global southern ocean. Not only these seals travel over very large distances, but as soon as they leave shore, they will start diving. And they, when they dive, I mean, they dive continuously and very deep. And when I'm saying very deep, I mean, it's, uh, uh, you can see here uh, that this seal was regularly diving to four or to 600 meters. And on average, uh, they dive about 500 meters. Each dive will last about 20 minutes. And they can dive up to 2,000 meters if they need to. And between each of these dives, they will spend only three minutes at most at the surface to breathe. 
So every day they will perform 60 dives. So we took advantage of that behavior to collect some oceanographic uh, uh, data. And those computers that we put on the head of these seals uh, not only give us some information about the track of the seals, and you can see Kerguelen, the Antarctic continent, and as the seal is traveling, we are collecting continuously some information about the temperature, but also about the salinity of the water masses. And here you can see along the track, the temperature uh, monitored by the elephant seal as the seal was going down to Antarctica with much colder water close to Antarctica. And this was late summer, and when the seals came back to Kerguelen in wintertime, you can see the changes in the water masses with water cooling down uh, through, the, through the winter. And so, right now, the elephant seals are the main source of oceanographic data for the Southern Ocean. 98% of the temperature and salinity data for the sea ice area are co being collected by southern elephant seals presently. So that it's a major contribution to observe that ocean. So another type of equipment we put on these seals is uh, head-mounted accelerometers. Why we put them on the head is by, uh, because we can detect head movement of the seals when they are trying to catch a prey. So it's uh, an indication if they are encountering prey and how many times they try to catch. And then we can, so here what you can see is a continuous dive records for 24 hours. The color indicates the temperature, the redder, the warmer, so blue, uh, blue water indicates cold waters. And each of these dots correspond to one of these prey catch attempts. So what you can see here is those seals will tend to dive deeper when the water surfaces are warmer, so they tend to target these fish in colder water masses. And so one of our questions we are really interested uh, on uh, is all these seals locate their prey when they are underwater? Because uh, as I said, they are diving very deep, so there is no light, so they cannot really use uh, their, I mean, the light coming from the surface to locate their prey. So, and they do not use like cetacean echolocation. So they have to rely on other senses to locate their prey. And, one, and so there are three very likely senses that they can use, eyesight and mostly to locate uh, what we call bioluminescence. Many organisms uh, underwater are bioluminescent and eyesight uh, of elephant seals are really sensitive to very low light levels. And what we have been able to show, they are much more successful in areas where we detect high bioluminescence levels. And to, uh, to, do, to address that question, we put a light sensor on the head of the seals, recording these bioluminescence events during the dive of the seals. They also rely on hearing, probably, to locate their prey. And also, they got these long whiskers. And we know from work which was conducted in captivity that they can use these whiskers to locate the vibration produced by the fish moving or swimming in the water column. So they use that to detect their, the fish movement. And not only we can also um, use these seals to collect some information about the oceanographic conditions, the prey field, but also, by putting some hydrophones on them, we can also assess uh, the acoustic biodiversity of the Southern Ocean. And one of the beauty about elephant seals, when they sleep, they do not sleep at the surface, they sleep by letting themselves drift within the water column. And as they are drifting, they are completely silent. So we have some listening points and during which we can record their and, uh, acoustic environment. And from that, Along the track, we got some listening points, and we can see how often we detect uh, sounds, biological sounds, which can be produced by whales, and in particular by blue whales, so Antarctic blue whales, but also from the sounds, we can distinguish different species of whales being present within the area. So we use them in a way to conduct a, an acoustic line transect between Kerguelen and Antarctica and to see if there is some variation in cetacean density, acoustic density along their track. So as you can see, I mean, we can use this animal to get a better understanding of their environment, 
in terms of physical oceanography, but also in terms of the uh, ecological environment. Okay, thank you. So from the Antarctic now to the Arctic. Uh, Josh London is a research scientist with the National Marine Mammal Lab uh, working in Seattle. Thank you, Andrew. Like, uh, like you said, we're going to now move pretty much to the other side of the world and um, talk about bearded seals. This is a, an adult bearded seal pictured here. Bearded seals are one of the, um, are, the are the largest of the Arctic um, seal species and are of very important and in interest to us of recent times because you can see here this seal is resting on sea ice and with concerns about climate change and trying to understand um, the impacts of climate change, one of the things that we're working on is how do we anticipate that these seals might respond to a changing climate. And bearded seals are um, one of the, the uh, four species of ice seals in the Arctic um, off Alaska that uh, rely on sea ice for resting. Um, unlike Kristoff seals, they, um, they like to spend a little bit more time at the surface and so uh, might take a nap on the sea ice. And uh, bearded seals also are benthic foragers, so they feed down in the sediments on clams and mussels and some uh, benthic fish. But our work in the Arctic isn't just about the seals. We also, um, it's important for us and, and important for our work to collaborate with local Alaskan natives. Pictured here, you can see our crew of both scientists and Alaskan natives who work together. Um, in Alaska, uh, native hunters rely on, and communities rely on bearded seals, especially for, for food. And um, it's an important cultural aspect to their communities. And so we work together to try and understand more about these species. During uh, over several years, we were able to uh, catch seven adult bearded seals. It was one of the first times that adult bearded seals had been captured in the state of Alaska in the Chukchi, the Beaufort um, seas. Uh, we were actually did most of this work near Kotzebue, Alaska. And um, to this point, and, and the theme of the talk has really been big data. And I feel a little bit inadequate because this is actually a talk about big questions answered with, with small data. Um, this is the, uh, the biologger that we used, um, one of the biologgers we used for, for our work on bearded seals. It's uh, attached to the, uh, the rear flipper of a bearded seal, and it's kind of like uh, wearing a, an earring, or, or maybe you've seen cattle that have a, a little uh, number in their ears. And uh, the, the tag that you saw Christoph applying, those tags are glued on and seals molt. They, they grow a new coat of hair every year, and that means that Christoph's tags will only last on that seal for, at most, you know, 11 or 12 months. And we were interested to learn, how, what, what do these seals do year after year? <clears throat> and so these small um, biologgers that are attached to the flippers allow us to understand something about what animals do over time. But you can see there's a small battery in there, there's small tags, and so we get very, what I would call, small data, but we're going to answer a big question. So uh, we were able to attach uh, seven of these to, um, to bearded seals. And uh, from that, we were able to learn that um, they leave the Kotzebue area. You can see this is Kotzebue right here. The seals leave Kotzebue. And during the summer, when this part of the ocean is ice-free, they move up into along the coast and spend the summers up there. But then as the ice starts to come back down, as the ice starts to form, as it gets colder, the bearded seals start to move south. And, and most of the bearded seals um, off Alaska and the Chukchi and Beaufort move down through the Bering Strait into the Bering Sea for the winter. There are some that stay up in the, off the north coast of Alaska, but most of the seals move down here into the Bering Sea. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, so we were kind of interested in this winter time period, you know, where do the seals spend their winters? And this is a combined over from 2010 to 2013. This is all the locations that we got from all of the seals in our study uh, during, during the winter time period. And you can see each seal is a different color. And you can see that they all have um, fairly similar areas. And what's even more amazing to us is that if you kind of break this down year by year, and this is the key thing that these tags that stay on for a long time were able to show us, you can see here you've got three seals, and they went to a particular area in 2010. 
And then as we move on to 2011, you can see they start coming back to the same spot. The orange seal is down here. The, the green and the purple seals are up there at the top. And then again in 2012, we've got again the orange seal down here and the, the green and the purple seal up there. And so you might ask yourself, why would a seal keep going back to the same spot in a place like the Bering Sea? And, and as I said, we're really looking at this winter time period. And during the winter, the Bering Sea is covered in ice, but it's not a solid sheet of ice. And if you could imagine if you're, a, if you're a seal that requires to breathe air, that you might want to come up to breathe air where there's not so much ice. And you can see uh, a little bit in this image that during the winter time period, there are areas of ice that are thicker than others. And it turns out that these seals are uh, picking areas of the Bering Sea that are historically, over long periods of time, um, these are areas where there are more openings, less concentration of sea ice. And so we think it might be a more preferred area for these animals. And once they learn about a spot, and they know that there's reliable food there, they keep coming back to the same spot year after year. And these are the kind of things that we're trying to just get a handle on now so that we can understand how these animals might be impacted by climate change. And, um, and like I said, it's, a, it's actually a fairly small tag and a very small amount of data, but we were thankfully able to answer what has been a, a fairly big and interesting question. Thank you, Josh. So our next speaker is Beth Volpov. And so now we're going to go back south, but not quite so far south, to Australia. And Beth is a PhD candidate at Deakin University. Go like this. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, I would also like to thank my fellow co-authors and my supervisor at Deakin, Dr. John Arnold, and the collaborators at National Geographic. Um, as anyone who works on marine mammals knows, um, it takes a lot of people to collect this kind of data, so I'm merely just the ambassador for today. Uh, so one of the questions I'm looking at for part of my PhD thesis um, I want to know when a seal captures a fish. This is because overall, one of the holy grail questions with marine mammals is wanting to know how much food they require, i.e., how much fish do they need to survive each day? And one of the ways we can answer this is actually using some of the data loggers you've heard about today. Um, this study was done on Australian fur seals, as you can see in this picture. And for this technique, we have an accelerometer mounted on the seal's head. The accelerometer is used to estimate the prey capture attempts or to measure the animal's three-dimensional movement when they're catching fish. This is just an estimate, however. It needs to be directly validated. And one way you can do that is by observing it on video. So these animals are also outfitted with video cameras from National Geographic. And by comparing our estimate of when they're catching fish to the direct observation on the video, we can compare them and get a measurement of error or accuracy in our ability to do that. So the accelerometers, as you heard from Christoph, measure the three-dimensional movement on the seal's head. This photo is to orientate you to a video I'm going to show you next. Uh, you can see this is the head accelerometer mounted on the first seal's head. So in this video, you're going to see a successful fish capture. The fish shows up on um, the right side as a white dot. And I want you to pay attention to how this seal is moving its head as it's catching the fish in all three dimensions of motion. And you see her capture the fish right there. I'm going to slow it down to half speed so you can get a better look at it. These animals are benthic divers. They don't dive as deep as the elephant seals you've heard of before. Um, they're restrained by the depth in the area they forage. It's all less than 100 meters, so far shorter than an elephant seal. Sometimes they catch prey that is more interesting than a fish. This is a video of an Australian fur seal. It just picked up an octopus, and it's taking it to the surface because the prey is too large to consume at depth. And something interesting that I want you to look at is how little of head movement there was at depth. So the accelerometer would not catch a lot of movement at depth, although um, there was a huge amount of prey consumed, and an octopus represents more energy than a fish does. So that's what the video collected. Let's see what the accelerometer got us to compare with. 
So that's not quite so fun to look at. <laughs> um, this graph shows you this is a four minute interval of acceleration in three um, dimensions. Um, and so the problem is it's not very intuitive when you look at this data, how many fish were caught or what's going on. And so what we do is we use a mathematical function to detect a reliable pattern in this movement over many seals and many dives over time. And we're able to use math to do something that our brains can't do, which is actually pretty cool in the end. I'm gonna skip all the math part for now and just tell you that yes, we are able to use math to ultimately figure out um, how many fish a seal catches per dive. We're able to get detection rates or true positive rates of 82 to 97%. So what that means is if the accelerometer estimates a fish caught 97 fish, um, the video says they actually caught 100. So we're able to quantify the difference between our estimate and the actual video. And then you're able to add this up and find out how many fish a seal catches per dive and per foraging trip, and that's how much energy um, the mom is able to bring back to her pup and how much energy she has to survive in the end. So that's ultimately the currency that these animals live on. So um, this study actually turned out very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. So I want to know bring you back to right here. Because not only is biologging and these incredible tags being used in the Arctic and the Antarctic and other places, it's being used right off of Point Grey. And there's a study that was started two weeks ago where 20 seals have now been caught and instrumented to answer this question or actually to get us to this point of trying to understand whether or not this very high density of seals that live in the Strait of Georgia could be responsible for the failure of Chinook and Coho to recover. And the thinking isn't that they've been eating too many adult fish. The thinking now is they're eating too many little tiny fish. And while it makes up a very small percentage of their diet, a very small percentage multiplied by something that is so tiny adds up to be an awful lot of fish. And it could well represent half of perhaps the, what's been released by a hatchery. So we're doing some research here to figure out how many young fish are being taken. And as you've seen in many of the pictures, the biggest challenge is always, how do you get the tag onto an animal? And so in this case, it was using nets that were gonna be streamed out near shore to hopefully entangle seals and bring them ashore. After which, tags could be attached to them. And what was interesting with these tags, there were two types, one type, and this is the master's research of Hassan Alec, um, programming the tags that will be glued onto the fur and give us location and fine scale movements to understand where they're going and what they're doing. But there's another really interesting piece of technology which is being used for the very first time. And here you're seeing uh, Austin Thomas who is gluing on, onto the head of a seal a device that can read the tag numbers of fish that have been tagged. And so we know that fish can be tagged with small little tags that have unique numbers. And a biologist would take this hand and wand and put it over the fish's body to read its number. Well, the idea here was, could we put this tag reader on the head of a seal, and as the seal is swallowing a fish, could it read it? It was tested here at the aquarium and shown to work. And uh, with wildlife computers, they put a lot of time into trying to get a device that would work. And we've got, I think, quite a phenomenal system, and on Friday the fish were released, actually I think, and the first um, uh, fish was swallowed and relayed by satellite to tell us that yes, Eureka, they are eating these little fish with tags in them. And so you're gonna be hearing more about this story um, over the coming 12 months. Um, and so if, should any of you see one of our cell phone equipped seals, you know where it's from. Uh, the head tag will fall off and sink, but the back tag is designed to float and uh, we expect to recover them, and perhaps people find them on the beach and turn them into us as well. We've got a couple little maps here, but ultimately we're gonna get a sense of how the animals are using the Strait of Georgia and how they're traveling to different hollowed sites. And we're gonna get a picture um, of the use in this area that no one's ever gotten before. So I hope with that you've gotten a sense of some of the incredible things that we're learning with these electronic packages. Um, I think we're just 
scratching at the tip of this iceberg of knowledge that's flooding in. And fortunate for us this week by having, myself as a biologist, having so many statisticians and listening to the techniques that they're developing, I, the future, I think the future is very, very bright. Thank you very much. And what I'd like to do now is ask the speakers to come up front, and we'll see if we have some questions. I'm going to turn over to Jonathan to... Go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, so we have an online question. So um, are any of the data that are collected through this type of work shared with port authorities or local authorities so that they can help get traffic, shipping traffic, etc., around the animals so that uh, they can help protect the animals? Brian, do you want to say something on that? Uh, yeah, I'll say something on that. Um, I've just been involved in a project with DFO, and we didn't actually use uh, biologging or tags to assess uh, ship strike uh, risk areas, but we have been using uh, aerial survey data uh, to look at where uh, concentrations of large baleen whales, say like humpbacks and fin whales, are in the approaches to the Juan de Fuca Strait and trying to figure out uh, how that overlays with shipping data and where those high-risk areas are and perhaps um, then come to some management goals for how we would um, perhaps recommend that ship traffic approach the Strait of Juan de Fuca to minimize the risk to the whales. And I can tell you another interesting use with some of these tags. In southeast Alaska, there's a problem with um, sperm whales stealing fish off of the long lines for, for black cod. And it's caused such a problem that the fishermen can't figure out what to do, they can't stop it. So some satellite tracking tags have been put into the bad boys. And the fishermen are now monitoring where they're moving. And they will pull their gear when they know that whale is far away from them. <laughs> and so the fishermen are now using this technology as well to outsmart uh, the, the, the predators. A question over there? Oh, wait, wait. oh, Jonathan's at the back. Um, just looking at some of these pictures, the uh, biologger apparatus and the tagging process, well, the, the uh, physical apparatus, like it, they, some of them seem quite prominent. And in the tagging process, like it seems like there's restraint and sedation often used. And I'm just wondering, how do you account for uh, the effect that these devices have on the animals, whether it's their motion, their behavior, how other organisms perceive them, susceptibility to injury and disease. Uh, how do you account for the observer effect? Yeah, we can both give an answer. Okay. I mean, it's something we, we try to take into consideration. So uh, to account for that, uh, what we, we do is to compare, for instance, on the sovereign elephant seals, the breeding performances of individuals which have been equipped in comparison to individuals which haven't been equipped. And this work was done by some Australian colleagues and they did that on Macquarie Island where they have a long-term monitoring uh, program. And what they have been able to show is that they could not find any differences in the mass gain of the females, in their breeding success, in the winning mass of the pup. It's not to tell that uh, this has no effect on the animals, but that the, under normal environmental conditions, these animals are able to compensate for this added handicap. Uh, this may become more critical under uh, a stressful year, so when the animals are really struggling to find their uh, food resources. And, um, but on, on that special case, over several years, and even if you equip the same individuals repeatedly, they haven't been able to detect any effect. But it's not to tell that this has no effect on the animals. But uh, under, as long as you re remain with something which is small enough, and of course, I mean, for big tags, I mean, generally the deployments are, tend to be shorter, so over a week period or two weeks period, and for longer deployments, we tend to put smaller equipment. So I would just add to that for the, uh, for the bearded seals that I talked about, you notice that those tags were relatively small compared to the other tags. And, and part of the reason is because we were attaching them to the rear flippers, which are really important for propulsion. And, um, and we knew that these tags would be on the animals for a long time. So we wanted, we it was a question we've had for a long time, 
but the technology wasn't quite there yet. And so this is a situation where we finally came in line with where um, the tag manufacturers and, and technology that we all use every day finally got to a point where they were small enough and the batteries were just small enough that we were able to, to attach those tags to the rear flippers and, um, and take advantage of that. And, and an important thing that we always try to consider is, is what are the questions we're going to answer with these tags and what are the balance. And um, in that case, it was something where we recognized that by taking this, this effort, we were able to, to learn um, a pretty significant and interesting question or answer a question. And we've also done some work here at the aquarium by putting different tags of different shapes onto the seals and sea lions and measuring um, how many calories they're burning to see if there's an increased drag effect. And the tag manufacturers have been providing copies of their different tags and working with us. But it's in the back of the minds of all the biologists. We care about the animals. And so it is this trade-off of trying to minimize any additional energetic cost to them at the same time getting information that's going to help an entire population or species. Right. We have another question right here. Yeah, I'm wondering about uh, collisions uh, with uh, uh, ship traffic in terms of whales and this technology and also in terms of beaching, whether it could be used to discover, you know, the mass beachings of whales and dolphins and stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, as of yet, uh, DFO hasn't applied tagging technology to those things. Um, Mass beachings tend to not to go unnoticed um, on the coast because people are, you know, looking out for them. Even a single whale beaching is a pretty uh, spectacular event. Of course, there are locations on the coast where people don't frequent too often, but uh, usually if there's a whale that's beached on the coast, uh, Fisheries and Oceans finds out about it pretty quick, uh, just from locals. Um, in regards to ship strike, uh, the difficulty there is to have sort of not only do you want to know the risk to a single animal of, of being struck by a ship, you want to infer the risk to the whole population of whales. So we've found that the best way to estimate this um, that we know of is, is to do uh, counts of animals and find out where there are concentrations of, say, fin whales or, or uh, blue whales or humpback whales. And, and to do it that way is, is just to sort of a more comprehensive um, um, picture for us than, than tag data would be. But we, we could apply tag data to answer that question. Uh, we've just chosen to use uh, these aerial survey platforms because for us it was, um, we had the access to them and it was a really good way to answer that question. Hi, my question was really motivated by uh, the talk that Josh gave, but I guess the rest of the SEAL people might have an even more robust answer because you might have more animals um, monitored. I'm wondering whether the overlap in the feeding territories means that the animals might be related and whether the um, younger animals have actually larger feeding territories because they're less efficient maybe than the adults and whether any of that is known in general. That, that's a really good question. I think that's something that um, we're always interested in kind of understanding the individual variability. And, and um, that's one of the things that some of these higher resolution tags really start to get us is we really understand how an individual could be very different. And maybe a younger animal is still learning and an older animal is a little more um, wiser and, and kind of has a better understanding. In the case of the bearded seals, um, one of the re we had done some previous work where we had put um, more of the typical tags out on younger animals, uh, mostly because younger animals were a little bit easier for us to catch, probably because they weren't so wise. Um, and so we had a larger sample size. And um, they tended to wander around a little bit more. Um, and uh, we're still trying to find their way in the world. And so we were, um, it was very interesting to us in a nice contrast once we were able to catch a few of these adult animals to realize that there is this kind of pattern there. And I think that's something that, at least in my experience for the seals that I work on, it is kind of, that's how a wild animal starts to um, kind of be successful in the world, is to find out what works and kind of stick with it. And, um, and as we are um, entering into a time period where there's lots of change in the environment, 
Um, the animals that are, more, that are more able to adapt, the more plastic animals, are the ones that might have a better chance of surviving as we go through that, those, those changes. And those that are a little bit more um, stuck in their ways, it might be a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah, I mean, we did some work on that on sovereign elephant seals. I mean, not using tags, but using what we call stable isotopes, which are giving us some indication about where they forage. So we did that on teeth, because on a teeth you got the, the whole record of the life of the animal. And what we, we've been able to show is that during the first few years, these animals tend to wander over much broader areas, and by the age of two to five, they become faithful to, the, to their foraging habitat, and they won't change then for the rest of their life. So the earlier in your life you will become faithful to your foraging habitat, the longer you will live. So, um, and if you become faithful, it's because you found a good foraging, uh, uh, for a good foraging location. So, so yes, I mean, uh, when you are young, you explore, and then as soon as you found a good spot, then you stick to it. We have another question up here. <clears throat> Um, thank you, everybody, for taking the time tonight to give your presentations. Um, my question is uh, largely inspired by something that I believe Andrew said in his talk, which was the biggest challenge is how do you get a tag on an animal? Um, and in my question, I just I want to make something very explicit, and that is gender. Um, so in trapping the seals, uh, the elephant seals, Christoph uh, assured us that we need strong men to do this task. And the image that accompanied this statement uh, was three men sort of, um, they had this, this bag over this seal's head and they were, they were pulling this direction and that direction. Um, being from Alberta, this reminded me quite a lot of the rodeo actually. Um, likewise, with some of the other seals tracked, we had an image of a man mounting a female seal and accompanying, accompanying this was the statement, uh, you would not want to do this to a bull. But Brianna, um, tracking a much larger, much more lethal mammal, was able to do so, in her words, uh, which I think were accurate, non-invasively. So my question is, why is it that seals require strong men to pin them down and mount them, terrify them, uh, but killer whales can be observed non-invasively in a gentle way that anyone, not just a strong man, can do. Um, well, maybe I'll start on that one. I certainly could have shown you pictures of some strong women uh, <laughs> sitting on the backs as well. And uh, some of those strong women are here in the audience. Uh, so they're very capable. Um, you've seen a selection of pictures that we happen to have. And it may have just reflected a particular field season. But I know many who could uh, put you down. And, uh, and hold you in place. The challenge with the seals is they've got extremely sharp teeth. And for the bulls, you know, if a human is in amongst them, the bull will kill you. Uh, no questions asked. And uh, so the animals are handled in the most humane and safe way possible uh, to make sure we don't do any harm to them and also make sure that people don't get hurt at the same time. And I'll just uh, preface that as uh, the person on the front of the boat was actually not myself. Um, it was a researcher named Mike DeRoos. Um, some people may know him as the, the builder behind the blue whale at UBC. And he was chosen to apply the tags not really on a men are stronger than women kind of basis, but because he had done it before. And it's incredibly difficult to do. And you have these very expensive tags, a very expensive field season and every day costs you money, every missed attempt costs you data and, and time. And so Mike came out and helped us uh, and gave his experience to our team um, just to get that data. And we were incredibly uh, successful because of his experience. And I also know many women that are similarly experienced at, at attaching tags, so. Hello. Um, it's partly a re response to the, to the question. So I'm I'm one of the statisticians that's here. So I don't actually know anything about animals at all. But um, so from a statistical point of view, um, it's actually really convenient if the animal presents itself and you can glue a tag on it and get a long-term piece of information back. And one of the very frustrating things about whales and dolphins is they don't do that. Um, 
So um, the fact that they can put a suction cup base tag on an animal and it falls off after a day is, is a source of frustration for us. So although those are very non-invasive, those, those kinds of um, tags, they're also very frustrating. Um, it would be much nicer if, if they would put themselves, um, make themselves available to glue a, glue a tag on. So it really isn't a gender issue, I don't think. It's something just to do with the biology of the animals. And just as you're going for your next question, um, you know, I know in Norway there's a period of time when the researchers were capturing killer whales, putting them under the decks of ships and sticking, uh, attaching to the dorsal fins, um, extremely invasive, and actually caused dorsal fins to deform. Um, that's no longer done. Any more questions from our audience tonight? Uh, would you like to make any final remarks, Andrew, before I make mine? Um, no, but I think I might just turn to Jim Zittick, who's come in here as our statistician, and uh, the experience for you talking about biology. Yeah, no. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this has been a... Uh, oh, thank you. Th this has been a wonderful opportunity uh, for us to get involved with these big data sets because that's a very active and, and hot area in our subject nowadays. Uh, these big data sets arise in all sorts of different ways. And this has served as a very challenging paradigm in which to develop brand new statistical methods uh, for use in this context as well as in other contexts. And so in particular, it's been a great educational opportunity for our students to get involved in tackling this kind of data. But the other thing I was going to say is that uh, one of the great joys of being a statistician is you get to work with all kinds of wonderful people in other disciplines in an interactive way and this uh, a particular uh, project has really been extraordinarily uh, re uh, enriching in this way as well. We've uh, found some really great new professional friends uh, nearby and afar, and so uh, there are many ways in which we have benefit, benefited. And I think our subject has also benefit, benefited from the new methods that we're developing in this context for application in other contexts. So uh, I would uh, conclude with that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And back to you, I think. Um, all right, well, I would like to thank all of our speakers that came here tonight. Andrew, I'm not trying to stand in front of you, sorry. Uh, thank all of our speakers for coming tonight. You did a, a great job, especially with our questions tonight. Um, wanted to thank all of you for coming here tonight as well. Uh, the next Vancouver Aquarium public program is next week, actually. We have Dr. Jeff Marleyoff coming uh, to talk about the monster in the closet. Uh, climate change versus uh, uh, re regime shift, looking at a different way, at looking at changes in our ecosystems. Uh, tonight's lecture uh, was part of the Sea Monsters Revealed uh, lecture series, uh, which is uh, here because we have uh, an exhibit here at the aquarium right now until September called Sea Monsters Revealed, where you can come and actually see inside some of the animals that live in our oceans. So it's kind of like body worlds, but for marine animals. Uh, so that's available for uh, everyone to, to come when they come to the aquarium. And uh, I'd just like to say a, a final thank you to uh, our supporters tonight. You, Peter Wall Institute, uh, University of British Columbia. Looking forward to future collaborations together. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.